All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Misfit Nation. If you are a veteran and you are struggling to feel like you're leading down that path to darkness, stop and think about those who are around you. Think about how they truly value you, how they will miss you. You are not alone. You need to talk to someone. Someone will listen to you. If you feel like you will be a burden to someone or you feel embarrassed about what's going on inside your head, you don't want your friends or family to know, call the anonymous hotline at 1-800-273-8255 and press one. They'll make a permanent solution to a temporary problem. If you're a new listener, thanks for joining us. Please subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast apps to include the military broadcast radio app and check out our family of shows there, all led by veterans, all great shows. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at the underscore Misfit Nation. That's the underscore Misfit Nation. Subscribe and click that bell. This will keep you up to date on our latest news, episodes, and of course, the stories of our guests. Speaking of which, our next guest is a retired police officer and a veteran from 86 to 91 who writes gritty crime fiction from both sides of the badge. He has written over 35 novels and dozens of short stories and hosts the podcast, Wrong Place, Right Time. Many of his novels explore the difficulty of the policing profession in a realistic way and the humanity of the men and women who do the job. So without further ado, let's welcome Frank Scalise, also known as Frank Zafiro, to the Misfit Nation. Welcome, Frank. Hey, thanks for having me. So I'm glad we could finally get this thing together. I know I had to delay it a couple of times due to some issues. And of course, today for a very important thing to go see something that we waited 30 <laughs> years to see. And I, I know we in the pre-show we spoke about this. You'll get to see it tomorrow. So I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but you will not be disappointed. You felt the need for speed? Oh, I did. And I want to do some pilot stuff. <laughs> so Frank, if you don't mind, uh, share with the Misfit Nation a little bit about your backstory from as far back as you want to go to how you got into writing and to where you are now. Uh, the short version is uh, that I I kind of always saw myself as a writer, even as a kid, um, certainly a storyteller anyway. Um, and then eventually, you know, figuring out that the best way to, to tell those stories is, is to write them down. Uh, you know, I wrote in high school, uh, after I went in the military, I was still, I was still writing. In fact, I, uh, managed to take a, a few courses while I was, uh, on active duty and, and including a creative writing course in, uh, Monterey. And, uh, uh, my first stuff was published while I was still in the, in, in the army. Um, and it was, you know, it was, I, that was kind of the formative period for me in more ways than one. Um, but, uh, but I, I figured out the army just wasn't for me long-term. I mean, uh, I just, uh, it wasn't, uh, I asked why too much, you know, and, and that doesn't always go over well when you're enlisted. I mean, maybe if I was an officer, I could have got away with asking why a little more often. Um, so I got out after, uh, uh, my four-year hitch was up and then, and then we got extended for, for desert storm. So, when that was all said and done, I, I got out and spent a couple of years trying to figure things out, uh, put some bread on the table, you know, and, and did a lot of different jobs, uh, but figured, you know, I either wanted to be a teacher or a cop and a teacher required a four-year degree. And thanks to the army, I had about a two, two and a half years of college, but it wasn't quite enough to, to get going. So uh cop it was right so i started, started applying for some positions down in california and then some family stuff was happening back up in spokane where i'm from so i i, I went back to help out and uh ended up testing for for my hometown department there and and got hired in 93 and uh in spokane washington so i was a police officer in spokane uh for the city police department there for 20 years and a day uh and during my career i I either did or I commanded the unit that did uh, pretty much everything a police department that size does, uh, which has been, was great for experience as a law enforcement professional. And it also helped me when I retired and, and started teaching police leadership, uh, a course that is actually based on the uh, West Point model, um, the leadership and organizations model that uh, Dr. General Howard Prince created for West Point uh, after the Vietnam era. Um, but anyway, I, I taught that all over the US and Canada, uh, 
leadership in placing organizations. And having had all that different experience in the in the department, it really translated well to being able to to connect with uh, the people in, in in other departments because whatever they did, I either had done it or I commanded the unit, so I was familiar with it, and uh, and that was a great experience uh, for sure. Um, and and I uh, but the the problem was I was traveling a lot for that two three weeks out of the year, and. I'd been writing the entire time. I mean, from the time I was in the army to when I came on the job, uh, I had about an eight year gap where I didn't write any fiction because I, I had gone back and uh, used my army college fund to get my uh, uh, undergraduate degree in history. And, and so I was doing that full time, working full time. I had kids, you know, on, and was learning new positions on the, on the job. I just didn't have time for, for fiction. Um, but, uh, you know, after about eight years of that, I started writing fiction around 2004. So for the last 10 years or so of my career uh, in policing, I was writing as well. And, uh, and then when I was teaching and on the road, I, I, I was writing then too. But particularly during that time period when I was teaching, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever taught, but anybody who teaches knows that if if you're doing it right, it's, it's exhausting. I mean, you, you just got to leave it all on the ice, right? You can't, you can't just get up there and drone Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. I mean, you've got to really put some energy into it. And so I wasn't getting a ton of writing done during that time period. So ultimately I hung up my PowerPoint clicker at the end of 2017. And since then um, I've been focused full-time on, on writing. And uh, most of what I write is crime fiction. Um, and I, I kind of, uh, cover most of the of the genre of the mystery genre uh, i don't like cozies um so no cats and yarn and grandmas um and i don't i don't write traditional either so like the agatha christie professor uh uh Poirot, i guess is his name that kind of stuff uh i mean i have respect for that i have friends who write both of those genres, but I just, I, cu I couldn't pull it off and it doesn't interest me enough to try. Um, but I write police procedurals, uh, police procedurals, which is, you know, focus on how the police go about their, their, their job solving the mystery or catching the bad guy, uh, private investigator, you know, PI novels, everybody knows what those are, uh, as well as hard boiled and noir from the criminal side of the, of the spectrum. So, if you like serious mystery that's not classical, then I got you covered. So your police novels, uh, do any of those come from real experiences with you or, or did you do investigations into other police officers and use them as your studies? Um, you know, I tried to stay really far away from using anything that really happened, not just in my career, but during my career to other people. Um, you know, I mean, I, I suppose if I'd been a New York, uh, city police officer, if I'd been NYPD or something, that's a big enough agency that people wouldn't be able to necessarily connect to, uh, you know, the two, uh, things, but, you know, our, our agency was, is a mid-sized, it's a mid-sized city, you know, and, and the, the agency wasn't that big. So I, what I did is I, I really drew heavily on the texture and the flavor and the, the nature of cases I dealt with and situations I dealt with, or that I was exposed to through uh, friends and colleagues. Um, but then I fictionalized, you know, I, I put them in a fictional story um, every, virtually every time. Uh, there were a few exceptions. Uh, it was the same thing with characters. Um, you know, I didn't base, with one very huge exception, I didn't base any characters on people I knew or people I had known. But I did take a little tiny piece of Bob and a little quirk of Sally and a little uh, hairstyle of Fran and a, you know, what, what kind of clothes Joe wears and, you know, and those things kind of filtered in, in one way or another, but uh, you know, no carbon copies. That's a, I mean, that's a good technique too. So especially like you said, with a mid-size uh, element there, mid-size city, everyone knows each other. It's, it's hard not to know each other when it's a, yeah. a small size city. And like you said, New York, they have probably the same amount of police as you had residents in your, in your city. <laughs> well, not quite that bad, but, uh, uh, you know, my, my agency was, uh, uh, you know, 250, 300 cops and, you know, maybe a total of four, 
four and a quarter, you know, employees in total uh, with civilian, uh, uh, you know, dispatchers and records people and, and other support staff, um, you know, at its height, NYPD has had 40,000 cops, you know, uh, so <laughs> a few factors of scale larger. <laughs> Just, and budgetary too, so it's, it's a lot of things Absolutely. to that effect right there. I mean, it's great you have uh, 35 novels right now, and uh, you said you actually up to 39 now. 39, no, oh, 39. Yeah, nice. yeah, I counted them up to. I, I was doing my my curriculum vitae updating, and I hadn't done it in a while, and and I figured I better double check my count, and I, I had 39 instead of 35. Well, that that's counting the June releases, so I guess I'm cheating a little bit. But <laughs> well, you gotta you gotta take credit where it's due, and June, <laughs> so it's coming. Um, you said you started writing in high school. You would write in high school. Was there someone that motivated you to write, or something that said, "Hey, I like that. I like that person's doing," and was kind of like a mentor to you at that age? You know, I really didn't have a mentor when it came to the writing side of it. Um, in, in that they mentored my uh, my progression as a as a young writer. Um, it was just a super massive drive, internal drive. Um, that is not to say I didn't have uh, three or four teachers who were very encouraging and who I learned some very good lessons from. Um, you know, some of them as as teachers can be and should be were critical you know i mean uh, uh you know i had a couple of teachers that i turned stuff into them and then i'd get you know patted on the back and everything was great and i got to thinking i was pretty awesome and then i you know turn it into one of my teachers and you know and he'd be critical and you know i mean he'd be he'd compliment what was good but he'd be critical uh and and so i did have uh you could call them mentors i mean they were teachers who were supporting me and who were giving me feedback um but I didn't need their encouragement to want to keep doing it uh, is, I guess, the, the one difference. Uh, it's, it's always been just a very uh, uh, just raging internal drive. Uh, nothing was going to, you know, was going to, I didn't need encouragement for that part. I needed guidance on the craft for sure. And there's been dozens of people who have, who have helped with that both directly um, and then indirectly people who I've read their book on, on, on the writing craft um, or just having read their work and, and learned from their product, uh, their, from their art, uh, you know, that's occurred as well. Is there any one author that stands out to you from uh, when you were growing up, when you started to have that passion that say, I want to write like him or her? Uh, when I was younger, like high school, junior high, high school age, even into my early 20s, um, it was probably Piers Anthony, I would say. Uh, Piers Anthony is a science fiction fantasy author. Um, he, he's, he's written anything from, uh, you know, flippant, funny, uh, you know, dick and fart jokes level stuff to extremely philosophical, serious, hard edged science fiction and everything in between. And he was a very prolific writer. And he also taught me a really cool lesson very early on in that as a, like about a 13 year old, I wrote him a letter. And, uh, and I, I got a, I got a letter back. I, it wasn't a letter. Actually, it was a, like a three by five card turned into a postcard with one side, the side that didn't have my address on it was completely filled with a manual typewriter with strikeouts and, you know, and, and, and all that kind of stuff is obviously just knocked out, you know, and no, no, you know, not looking to be fancy or perfect, but I think he answered me two or three times, if I remember correctly. And I just remember how incredible it felt to me. I mean, you got to remember, this is not just before the internet, you know, this is, you know, this is, you know, we're talking 1983, maybe, you know, something like that. Um, uh, you know, being able to reach out and touch celebrities or, or authors or, or whatever these days, I mean, we're in, we're separated by two time zones and we're talking in real time and looking at each other. Um, that was unheard of, you know, back then. And, and here's this author that I am absolutely gaga over. He's my favorite author at that time. And he's taken the time to write me back and answer my questions and tell me about the book that I might like to read next. And, and that level of personal, uh, 
well, the humility that came with that, I think, and that level of personal commitment to your readers really, really stuck with me long before I ever had readers. <laughs> and to your point, if it, in the 80s, uh, when you were starting to write, if someone's seen uh, what we're doing right now, this would be called science fiction. Because this is Yeah, this is this is Star Trek right here. <laughs> yeah. This is this is like a hologram talking to each other back then. So yeah, uh -huh. we're, we've uh, moved light speed ahead from the 80s when with the typewriter and the correction ribbons and the red ribbon in there. And you had to know which one mm -hmm. to use at what time and mm -hmm. you know, make all your errors. And hopefully the you, little white, the little white tabs that you had to slide between and hit the same key as your mistake. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Now, now, you, now you just backspace and it disappears forever. <laughs> you hit the Grammarly button. It does a lot of the work for you. <laughs> I've seen you also wrote a actual textbooks for police report writing and information monograph mm -hmm. on uh, police body cameras under your given name. Mm -hmm. So was it hard to switch from the fiction side to write to technical writing like that? Or was it an easy move for you? It was pretty easy because, you know, um, you know, people, they, they know that there's a lot of writing in police work, but they don't really know. I mean, they, they, they know conceptually because they hear cops complain about the paperwork or whatever. And it's, it's kind of a cliche or a stereotype on movies and, and, and so forth, but there is a ton of technical writing that takes place in, in police work, regardless of your position. It really doesn't matter whether you're a brand new patrol officer working in a, in uniform patrol on patrol or, Certainly, if you're a detective, but if you're, uh, you know, a sergeant or or in any kind of a leadership role, there's there's a lot of writing that goes on, and so it wasn't that big of a stretch at all. Um, I'd also been doing some course writing at that time, that same time that I wrote the the street officer's guide to to report writing um, for a, a, a national college online college. Uh, so I was doing a lot of technical writing in the field at the time. I did about seven or eight courses for them. And, and so it made it a lot easier. And the other thing is that, that that book, that textbook is the least textbooky textbook you're probably ever going to read. I mean, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's presented it very irreverently. And, and there's a lot of what I hope is humor in it um, the, the, and, and pop culture because as important as report writing is in policing, and it is a critical skill, um, it, it's it's given really short shrift when it comes to training. And part of the reason is it's it's a boring topic to talk about. I mean, you're falling asleep as I'm telling you this right now. I can see it. Um, you know, it's how do you how do you write? It's like it's like you know, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. You know, uh, you know, how do you write about how to write in a way that doesn't make people start sawing logs? And I figured that the only way to do it was to have it be conversational and have it make some funny references to pop culture and, and other things and to keep it very, you know, simple so that it's, it's, it's a conversation rather than the very dry academic way that I've seen most of those books be. And that might work for some people, but I think it's an obstacle for a, a lot of them. So I teamed up with a, another cop, a friend of mine, Doug Strotzel. Um, and, uh, we had a really nice, uh, partnership because he was, uh, he was a career pol uh, patrol officer at the time. Um, he's since become a detective recently in the last few years, but he was a patrol officer for a very long time. And he had done a couple of jobs in patrol that I hadn't done. And so I had the experience of a supervisor. I had experience of having been a detective and he hadn't been yet. But he had these other experiences that he could bring to the equation. And so uh, that really made for a much more rounded, rounded textbook. And it's a way overdue for a second edition. Uh, that's what I keep telling the publisher. Things have changed since I wrote the first draft and since it was published in 2012. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I get, I get a nice royalty check every year. So people are still using it. Outstanding. Royalty checks will make the world go round for you. Uh, you said you first got published, that was like in the army, right? When your first book was published, who, who picked you up and are, and are you still with that same publisher or do you publish yourself most times? Uh, yeah, it wasn't a book that was, it was short stories uh, and poetry that was published while I was, so my first publication credits um, happened while I was still in the army. Uh, had a short story called Bill's Son get published. And I don't know if that was actually my first published story, but it was the first one. I got paid for. So it's the one I saved the 
$5 check from or the $15 check or whatever it was. Um, in fact, I can look at it right now. It's up on the wall right here next to the first poetry one. Um, but uh, I didn't actually write a book until I'd been a cop for a couple of years. And I uh, wrote the first draft of Under a Raging Moon. And then, uh, then the, you know, the school started and the, the, the new job at, uh, within the police department every year or two started. And, and I, you know, kind of had that pretty, pretty good break of time where I wasn't uh, writing fiction. But after I started writing fiction again in 2004, it didn't take me long to pull that book back out of the drawer. And again, talking about how times have changed, literally pull a physical copy of a typewritten book out of a actual drawer uh, and start looking at it and uh, I ended up revising it and finishing it and uh, that that became the first book under Raging Moon the first River City book and uh, you know I, I will not bore you with the long and torturous road of my different publication adventures um, <laughs> so the upside of it is uh, it was first published by a small publisher in Georgia uh, that didn't work out because he didn't want to publish the second book for kind of a dumb reason, I thought, not because he didn't think it was a good book. So a different publisher agreed to pick up the second book and then uh, said they'd pick up the first book when the contract ran out. They overextended and published too many books at once and, and couldn't support their catalog and they went under. So then I had, and then, but then I got my first book back. So uh, in the meantime, I'd written the third book. So now I got books one, two, and three, two have been published by two separate publishers. One hasn't been published yet who's going to want these, you know, I mean, in, uh, in 2008, 2009 publishing landscape, those were orphans that nobody would want to touch. And, uh, I got lucky, uh, living in Spokane there, there was a printer, uh, a guy named Russ Davis who had a printer company who decided he wanted to delve into being a publisher and he wanted to publish local authors primarily. So, you know, my first publisher was in Georgia. My second one was in Florida when they kind of ghosted me a little bit. You know, what, what was I supposed to do? Hop on a plane? But this is right in my hometown. I can go knock on the door and say, how's it going? And, and so I did. And um, they ended up publishing the first, republishing the first two books. They published the third book. They published the fourth book. Um, but they didn't want to publish ebooks. He wasn't interested in digital. And that was right at the cusp um, I don't know if you remember this uh, or if your listeners will, but there was a time period where when you said ebook, people laughed and rightfully so, because it was really kind of like, here's a CD ROM, put it in your computer and read the book. Well, how is that more convenient than a physical book? I mean, it just, but around that time that the river city book was being, the books were being republished in print by, by gray dog press in Spokane, the, the Kindle age was upon us. Let's just put it that way, I guess. And so I was like, well, I'll, I'll publish them myself, you know, and then, then there'll be a digital version and for the print version that my publisher's doing. I sold way more copies digitally than I ever did in print. Right. And I started going, huh? So I started publishing all my own work for a while uh, uh, with a few exceptions. I, I had a couple of, of adventures with other publishers. Some went well, some did not. Publishing is a capricious business for sure. Um, ultimately, I found my way to a small uh, or I guess mid-sized publisher of darker crime fiction called Down and Out Books. And I moved a, about half my catalog to them uh, for a few years. And they're great, great, great people. Uh, you know, there's some tremendous books published there at Down and Out. Um, they still publish my novella anthology series, A Grifter Song. And in fact, they just renewed it for fifth season. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I have a great relationship with them, but I ran into the same problem. I think most people do with, you know, mid-sized to, to small publishers. And that is there really wasn't any marketing muscle behind any of the titles. And I started noticing that the titles I had published myself were selling about the same uh, in, in a couple of cases better than the, the ones that were published with Down and Out. And I kind of had to ask myself the question that a lot of authors in my position have to ask themselves, which is, all right, well, what is it that a publisher can do for you that you can't do for yourself? And, uh, you know, when, to, to publish a book, well, what do you need to publish a book? You need a good book. 
well, I, I'm going to write a good book either way, at least the best of my ability. So that's not going to change. You need a, an editor. Well, I can hire an editor as easily as the publisher can. Um, and if the editor is working for me, the dynamic's a little different too than if they're working for the publisher. I can hire a book cover designer and, uh, and, and get a book cover design. And if they're working for me, I get a lot more input into the final product. In fact, I control it entirely. Um, so, so far it's like three to me and none to the publisher. What's, why am I with the publisher? But then you get to marketing and ostensibly a publisher should do a better job of marketing than, than you will independently. At least that was my thought at the time. And then there's the, there's the topic of, or this, or the, the idea of cachet of legitimacy of uh, being able to say, I'm, you know, I'm published by Random House or I'm published by, you know, Bleak House or whatever, you know, publisher it is, carries a certain cachet even today still in the publishing world. And it means something to readers. So when I started looking at those last two things a little closer, I realized, you know what? A lot of people are publishing their own work. They're independently publishing and they're marketing like crazy. So that really isn't an advantage and it's not happening anyway. They just don't have the budget for it and they're, they're not putting the marketing dollars behind it. So that's not an advantage. That's advantage to independent publishing for me. So it all came down to, I'm giving up 50% of my royalties to be able to say I'm published by this publisher. And that's, so what is that? And there's value in that. I'm not denigrating it. There's value in it. Um, but what is the value? Is it worth 50% of my of my royalties. And, and ultimately I realized, you know, it wasn't. And if I wanted to really mark it and, and push my books, I was going to be able to do a lot better job if I had all of them and I can coordinate my entire catalog rather than half of them. So I talked to the publisher, we had a business conversation. They were, they were not offended. They understood my reasoning. They, uh, we, you know, came to terms on buying, buying my contracts back and, uh, and uh, I've been fully independent uh, as a pu in publishing my own work uh, since January of 2021. That's outstanding. I mean, it's a journey to get there, and you learned a lot along the way. Uh, a lot of the life lessons in the publish the public uh, publication world that a lot of authors uh, struggle with now and uh, go through that minefield as they want, like you were saying, legitimacy. They want a name behind their name that's saying that they're legitimate. Mm -hmm. But if you, like you also said, if you put out a good work it's legitimate enough right there and it's copyrighted once yeah. you it. so it, that's and, and it matters to some people who publishes it and that's fine i mean that's totally fine if that if that's important to you then you know you, you like a particular publisher great I, I don't there's nothing wrong with that um i just had to make a decision as a you know as the writer as the creator uh if it was if it was worth it to me and ultimately i wanted that all to be under the single umbrella right I mean, that's a great uh, business decision for both you and them since you did uh, professionally do it and buy out with them in a professional manner and do that the right way. And yeah, we stayed at, we're still on great terms. There's, it was, there's no hard, hard uh, uh, feelings at all. There was no heartache, uh, heartburn about it at all. Yeah. When you can take care of things the correct way, that that's how folks <laughs> can uh, work things through. So that's a great way to do it. And you, you have the, the crime series, the police series, and then you also I see you have a, a young adult series uh, based on on hockey because you're an avid hockey fan or, or rabid hockey fan. So how's that? How's that series going? Uh, I'm working on the third book in that uh, series right now. Um, it's 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 actually I'll be honest with you, it's harder for me uh, than the crime fiction. Um, you know, you're writing for nine to 12 year old kids. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to turn 54 this summer, you know, and, and, and for some people it's, that's, I, I'm, I'm amazed by them too. There are writers I know who that isn't a, an obstacle in the slightest. And I'm amazed by that. Um, I can remember being that young, but to, to inhabit it enough to, to, to write the book is uh, much more of a challenge than, like the crime fiction novel that I'm writing right now is my fourth Spokompton book. And the main character who I'm, I'm uh, writing in the first person for this one is a very small, like can fit through the doggy door sized female burglar 
uh, you know, and uh, who's a criminal. Now, I mean, I'm not a big guy, but I can't fit through a doggy door. Mm -hmm. And I'm male, and I've never burglarized anything. And so I'm quite a long ways away, you know, I mean, I, and she has a brother who's an addict. And, you know, I mean, it, it, that's a long ways away. That is still easier for me to write in some ways than, than to write the the 12 year old uh, boy. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's, it's, I, I do love hockey. I love the lessons that come out of hockey. I love the, uh, I love the way a kid that age can, can discover their own life lessons by uh, having some experiences and maybe making some mistakes. And because the support system is there, the parents and the coaches and the teachers and friends in their, in, in his life, uh, you know, there's a safety net in a way for him. And uh, the best thing anybody's ever said about those books, honestly, has been because they're, they, I mean, girls can read them all they want. And I hope they do, but it is about a 12 year old boy and it is a sports book. So I think it does lean a little bit more toward boys uh, for a target audience and uh, boys who don't read very much uh, have, have had parents say, I can't get him to read anything. And he devoured that book. Uh, of course, it was a little hockey player, right? So, I mean, and, you know, if you can, if you can get a kid interested, uh, get them to read about something they're interested in, then maybe eventually you can move them to being interested in reading, you know, and that's, that's a huge advantage in life to be a reader. That's outstanding. And like you said, you hit a target audience that you can actually see that you're helping people and helping them to learn the steps to read and become an avid reader as they grow older as well. So being an avid hockey fan, who's your favorite team and what do you think about the cup this year? Well, I've been a Philadelphia Flyers fan since about 1998. And uh, my team, uh, I think the official word for it is sucked this year. Um, I think that's, I think that's a scientific term for, for the season they had. Uh, I mean, we're picking fifth overall in the draft and we went down a spot. So we I think we're the first fourth worst team in hockey this year. It's been a rough, rough year. Um, but you stick with your team, right. Um, and, uh, uh, as far as the cup goes this year, you know, my, my team had a player, longtime captain, Claude Giroux, who was traded to Florida. And so I was on the Florida bandwagon and they just got eliminated by the Tampa Bay lightning. So I'm still mourning that. Uh, I have, uh, I have Colorado in the West and now that uh, Florida is out there, they're pretty much the, the team I'm, I'm rooting for. Um, I don't really care who goes in the East at this point. Although I think if I had to pick somebody, it'd be Carolina. See, Carolina's playing my team, the Rangers. So hopefully my mm. Rangers pull this one out <laughs> yeah i would like it for the you know for the for the orange and black and the rags to have a, a renewal of of rivalry and for that to happen they both have to be good at the same time you know it hasn't happened in probably since the 90s when they were both good so at the same yeah time. i think 2010 was a you know like they were about equal we we got it we squeaked in the playoffs at the end with that shootout uh, in, the, in the final game of the season and and then ended up going all the way to the cup final um but uh but yeah it's it, rivalries are great like i hate pittsburgh I, I love the city i've been there i've taught there i was one of the places i taught when i was teaching leadership and i, I really enjoyed the city uh and it's a beautiful arena if you've ever been but i hate the penguins you know i just hate them i think you probably do too if you're a rangers fan uh, I mean, Sidney Crosby is a great guy in real life and off the ice, but I just want to punch him when he's on the ice. And uh, uh, but rivalries are good. You look back at that 2012 series between the Penguins and the and the and the Flyers, and that was a great, great series, you know. And and uh, uh, it just really it, it sparks interest in the sports. It gets your blood up in a good way. And uh, and I, you know, I love it. I mean, your team's done a great job turning around from we're going to rebuild to now we're in the, the playoffs. I mean, that's like the fastest, re <laughs> fastest rebuild I've ever seen. It's, just, it's crazy what money can buy and make things happen. So Yeah, but everybody's operating with the same cap. So somebody's being smart is what's happening there, you know, picking the right people, spend the money on. I hope we keep them for a little while. Frank, uh, it's been great chatting about hockey, about authoring. If you can give three advice, three tips of advice for a young author or a, or a budding author, 
what would that be? Uh, I'm going to go with the uh, Stephen King advice first, and that is read, read, read. Uh, a good writer has to be an avid reader. Um, reading is push-ups for your brain. It's push-ups for your writing. Uh, and it's fun. And no matter what you're interested in, you can get books on it. I mean, people say that about podcasts now. Yeah, it's true. But guess what? Before there were podcasts, there were books. <laughs> and it's the same way. So I don't care what you're interested in. There's, there's plenty of books on it. So read them. Um, so that would be one. Uh, the second thing would be, uh, you know, is to learn the craft. It isn't, I'm not here to say that, that natural talent and ability isn't part of the equation because it is just like a, a, a musician or a, an athlete, but it isn't just talent and then everything happens. You, there's a craft to it as well. Uh, and you need to learn that craft. And that is honed by a lot of writing, a lot of revising, listening to what people tell you in terms of feedback, uh, not having thick skin or thin skin, rather, you need to have thick skin, uh, but you have to hone your craft. And if you do both of those things, uh, neither one will really matter if you don't do the third thing. And that is you have to believe in yourself and be tenacious. Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember who who said this, I, I used to know who said it, but there's a, oh, there's a, a, a writer named Joe Conrath, uh, who, who, when asked this question would say, you know, there's a term for a writer who doesn't give up, published. And then he had to revise that with the way that the publishing world changed. And now you can publish yourself. And he said, there's a word for a writer who doesn't give up, successful. Uh, but however you cut it, you know, you, you have to believe in yourself and you have to be tenacious. Um, and, and then if you've done the hard work of learning your craft and you've read widely, you're putting yourself in a good position to be successful. I'll say, I think that's a uh, three great bits of advice there. And a lot of people, a lot of people have given advice of get out of your own way, which is basically the same thing you just said, be tenacious and yeah. get out there and do it. And that, yeah. that's great advice. And I think that's what holds most people back, back, not believing in themselves. And if you, you believe you achieve and you move forward and that's the best way to that's live. A good, it's a good saying. If you believe you achieve, I like that. I like that. I can't tell you how many times I've been to gatherings, you know, parties, barbecues, whatever. And inevitably people will say, oh yeah, I, I, I'm going to write a book or I could write a book. And none of them ever do, <laughs> you know, I mean, the amount of people that actually go from saying they or thinking they might write a book to actually putting words on paper, maybe 1%, 10%, whatever percentage it is, but it just whittles down further and further as you move toward somebody who actually, you know, tries to have that published or does publish it or people who actually finish it or, you know, uh, that, that as the process goes forward, it's a smaller, it's an inverted pyramid and it's smaller and smaller numbers, but you have a particular with the publishing world, the way that it is now, you have 100% control over that. You know, you, you can, you can learn the craft, you can read and you can uh, stick with it and put out a quality product. You control all of those factors. And uh, that's a, that's a pretty good position to be in. Exactly. And uh, like you said, with the technology advances that we have seen in our lifetime uh, to now, <laughs> I, you can write a short story on uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Zello, I think it's called now, where you can just do episodes at a time and let people give you feedback immediately before you make the whole thing and, and publish it. So you take that feedback and you, you run with it and you become that success that you want to be. So Frank, Thanks for coming on. How does someone get in touch with you to either have you be on their podcast or even get some tips and tidbits for you one-to-one? -one? You know, the, the simplest answer is my website, frankzafiro.com. Uh, it's got pretty much all the information on there and links to where I'm at on social media and a contact button to, to be able to email me directly. Um, and then, uh, and the other place probably is, you know, the big A. Uh, if you go on Amazon and click on my, on my uh, author name. I have an author page there. And the cool thing about that is you can follow somebody on Amazon. And then when something new comes out, they'll shoot you an email and say, Hey, you know, this author has a new book coming out, you know, that you're interested in. So that's kind of nice. Things don't slip through the crack that way. Awesome. Uh, Frank, uh, once again, thanks for being with your patience and uh, 
with getting this thing put together and scheduled. And uh, thanks for coming on and sharing your story with my listeners and the, the Misfit Nation as a whole. And uh, hopefully you uh, have a great time tomorrow. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. And I am, I am looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing the culmination of 30 years of waiting tomorrow. So you will not be disappointed. Have a good night. <laughs>